see, we're growing GDP. So it doesn't matter that employment has fallen by 15 million people in six years. It doesn't matter that shops are closing. It doesn't matter that enterprises are all sh shutting shop. Because GDP is growing. How do we know GDP is growing? Believe us. This budget was extraordinary because it was all based on false numbers. Similarly, we in India, we don't tax our rich enough. We don't have any wealth tax, we don't have any inheritance tax. We're one of the few countries in the world that doesn't have these taxes. This is not a regime that has given me a lot of confidence in their economic management. From the ramparts of the Red Fort on August 15, Prime Minister Narendra Modi reiterated his ambitious target to achieve 5 trillion dollar economy dream. Now, on the other hand, macroeconomic indicators are suggesting a visible sign of the slowdown in the economy. So the question is, would we be able to achieve the 5 trillion dollar economy dream of Prime Minister Narendra Modi? Or what exactly is the scale of the economy crisis and how should we tackle it? To talk more about it, we are joined in by one of the world's leading economists, Jayati Ghosh, who is a professor at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. And as the discussion is ongoing in the India right now, that are we heading into the recession, the ongoing slowdown, so my first question to you is, how do you see the economic situation right now in India? Like it's a slowdown, it's a structural or cyclical, are we heading into a recession? I think these dichotomies are wrong. It's obviously a slowdown, there's no question about it. I think it is worse than we're getting from the GDP data because the GDP data doesn't match with all the other indicators. It's not just employment, it's sales, it's investment, everything is down. It's been happening for a while, it's not new. And therefore I would say that it is systemic. It's not just uh, some, you know, aut cyclical suggests that it will automatically rise again. Mm. It won't. So basically you are saying that it's, it's a structural? It's a structural and serious concern. So it, can we draw interpretation out of this that we are heading into a recession? Well, you know, a recession technically is just a decline in GDP for two successive quarters. So that itself is not a very, um, I mean, you can have a recession and still be in a cycle. You can still come out of it. This is slightly worse because this could even just be a significant stagnation. It could be more than just a recession. It could be something where actually it then also metamorphoses into a crisis of some kind. So according to you, what are the various factors that are aggravating this crisis and what went wrong in last four and a half, five and a half years when the Modi came into the power? It's not, let me be honest, it's not beginning with Mr. Modi. It is certainly that they have added to the problems, but it didn't begin there. The basic problem is that we had a growth that was very unequal. So it led to a lot of increase in GDP, but it didn't generate much wage growth some but not enough and not enough employment growth so already by about 2011 12 there were concerns that this is not growth that is generating too many jobs hmm. okay what happened after that is that we didn't see any more expansion in job growth in fact we got a worsening so what mr modi did or what this the regime did was two really bad policy moves which is to say demonetization and the gst that was very poorly implemented which made the informal economy suffer disproportionately. Now, the informal economy employs about 85% of the workforce. Mm. Um, about 95% of the workers are anyway in informal jobs. You do something that deprives them of liquidity, credit, mm. demand, etc., for a year and expect no impact, that's impossible. So, what happened is that people who lost their jobs, people who got worried about the future, stopped spending. And that had what we call a negative multiplier effect. You stop spending, the shopkeeper stops selling, he stops buying his supplies, the people producing it cut down mm. their, spending, uh, their production and so on and so forth. So those negative multiplier effects have now started feeding into the formal sector. You see, all this time the formal sector was less affected. Mm -hmm. But that fall in demand in agriculture, in uh, informal activities, that has now affected the formal sector. So now it's the formal sector which is crying. And it's not just automobiles. Now it's everything from toothpaste to biscuits to tea, right? Everybody is crying that no one is buying anything. So recently a comment was made by Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog that we are witnessing unprecedented slowdown in the last 70 years. 
and the reason for that is the indiscriminate lending that started in the UPA regime. So, what's your quick comment on that? Well, yeah, this is a bit like blaming Nehru for what is happening today. Sure, there was indiscriminate lending. Sure, the banks needed to be cleaned up. Why weren't they? Five and a half years later, we have now more NPAs than we had then. So something is clearly going wrong in the way you've handled it. The banking system is in a serious problem. You have allowed non-performing assets hmm. to grow. You let bad loans expand. You're trying to clean it up, but you're not doing it properly. So yes, there is a problem in the banking system, which is adding to this demand problem. But the immediate crisis is nobody has my purchasing power. There's lack of demand. And the next question is that it, when this budget was about to be presented by Nirmala Sitharaman, many people had this hope that this budget will provide a lot of stimulus. So do you think that this budget lived up to the expectation of the different sectors of the economy and how do you see this budget? No, clearly it didn't, right? Because even the stock market tanked and everything tanked. This budget was extraordinary because it was all based on false numbers. So you, they, they didn't tell the truth about the taxes they had collected in the previous year. They made crazy estimates about the taxes they would collect in the coming year. They, we don't know how much they actually spent because they haven't, we don't know whether the numbers they've given mm. us are true or not. And if you are going to make crazy estimates about taxation, then you can't take the spending estimates seriously either. So it was very hard to take this budget seriously. I, we analyzed it and then I sat back and thought, why am I wasting time on this? Because none of these numbers is valid. Now it turns out that the 1.76 lakh crore that was the big hollow, hollow, somehow very neatly the RBI has decided to transfer exactly that amount. That is to the, the Union Bimal government. Jalan's committee recommended. Yes, well Bimal Jalan recommended that you can transfer a larger amount, but they didn't say 1.76 lakh crore. This nice neat amount. Uh, has now been handed over to the finance ministry to fill up the the gap in their budget. And when, as NBFs, like the many discussions went on that the whole problem lies in the NBSs, that NBSs have stopped lending to the yes. people. So the, the step taken in the budget about in uh, relation to the NBSC sector, do you think that that are enough to take them out of gloom? You see, again, you have to go back to the origin of this. How did all this begin? It began just after demonetization when the banks were not lending at all. Yeah, credit mm -hmm. collapsed. So the government pushed the NBFCs that you go out and lend, especially to small and medium enterprises. And they turned a blind eye to all excesses, including ILNFS, which then had a spectacular mm -hmm. collapse. So that also is actually a fallout of that crazy demonetization. Now, if you have to fix that mess, you can't simply say, go out and lend again. You have to first deal with all of the bad loans that they're sitting on. And ma'am, uh, recently KV Subraman, I mean, mm -hmm. in, a, 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 in a panel discussion said that people should not expect a fiscal stimulus. It's not necessary to tackle the economic slowdown because it would be lead to a moral hazard. So what would be your comment on that? I had the, uh, obviously, he's completely innocent of macroeconomics. Uh, what can I say? Uh, it's embarrassing to have to respond to a statement like that. Uh, first of all, obviously the government itself doesn't believe him because they are just <laughs> <laughs> trying to do fiscal stimulus by getting the RBI to transfer reserves, right? Mm -hmm. First point. Second point, in a macro economy, you have to look at the sources of the demand. If the private sector and households are not spending, there's only one agent left. It's the government that has to spend. It's kind of obvious. These are macroeconomic balances. The question of moral hazard will arise really with respect to things like, you know, taking over bad debts, not making you responsible. A fiscal stimulus, what has that got to do with moral hazard? Bizarre. And he went on to add that when risky venture lead to losses, industries would come running back to the government for support every time. No, that's a different issue altogether. Whether that if you want fiscal support for specific enterprises, that's different from a fiscal stimulus. Uh, Yes, it leads to moral hazard. We know that. Bank bailouts lead to moral hazard. Uh, we also know that there are situations where if you don't bail out, then the whole system collapses, like Lehman Brothers. Mm -hmm. Okay, So there is a fine line that you have to tread. But clearly, uh, talking about a fiscal stimulus as a moral hazard indicates complete ignorance. 
and today ma'am rbi uh, approved that the bimal jalan committee's recommendation that will transfer 1.7 mm -hmm. uh, lakh crore to the government how do you see this is this going to have a long term impact in the economy like it's going to improve the situation because now the government will have the funds that they are like from very long time they are they were saying that we want to have a fund we are running short of fund sure they're running for what it will do is help them sort out the mess they have made in tax collection yeah GST is way below target they're not collecting other taxes when the economy is slowing down you collect less taxes anyway so they've made a mess this will help them deal with that mess basically that's what this will do now i am in favor of a fiscal stimulus so i have no problem with the rbi transferring resources this is it's like monetizing the deficit it that's fine i don't have a problem with that however if you don't spend it in the right ways then it won't help you resolve the problem today the problem is lack of effective demand mm. you must put that money to use in solving that problem by first ensuring that there's demand in the system and i mean this budget uh, nirmala sitaraman proposed about the sovereign like the very uh, de debatable issue about the sovereign bond and fpi's uh, increase in the surcharge that led to fpi pull out in the stock like markets so what's your comment on that about the sovereign bond first and then surcharge on fpi like she rolled back well the the sovereign bond thing is a ridiculous dangerous and completely unnecessary idea uh so i would say that i'm very glad that the government has had second thoughts about that and i hope that they stick to the second thoughts because it is risky at a time like this when you see countries like argentina and uh, um uh, uh brazil basically going down the tube because of these excess debts it's absurd to say that we can actually float bonds and we'll be fine that we can just go and spend happily because of those that's the first uh on the tax on the portfolio assets i think that was a perfectly reasonable tax there's no problem with it but it's interesting that of all the things that she changed that was one of the first things that she rolled back because they are obsessed with the stock market as the indicator of success now in fact the stock market has not been a good indicator of success it's been performing wonderfully last year when the economy was already in very bad mm -hmm. shape so to re and it doesn't translate into more investment so when the stock market was scaling new highs all of last year investment was falling absolutely falling it doesn't mean that you will get more investment so i don't see why she has to go out of her way to placate foreign portfolio investors because it does no advantage to the economy i mean what, what about the hni people only the super rich super rich tax people similarly we in india we don't tax our rich enough we don't have any wealth tax we don't have any inheritance tax we are one of the few countries in the world that doesn't have these taxes so it's absurd and yet we have some of the top richest people in the world right regularly the top billionaires and all we have at least five or six in there so it's absurd for us not to tax them and then the next question is that the capital infusion of 70000 crore in the public sector banks and the ad additional liquidity into cash cash starved nbfcs do you think that they are enough to pull pull public sector bank and nbfc out of the gloom and kick start the lending no it's not enough it's not enough yet uh, each time they give some money it's always not enough hmm. so they gave 20000 then they gave 30000 crore now they're giving 70000 crore they already announced this in the budget didn't make any difference right all the all she said now is that i'm going to front load it that is i'm going to give it to them right now now the issue is this it will help them to resolve some of the bad loans but what's happening today is that the people whom banks are willing to lend to don't want to invest because the economy is slowing down where's the market so you talk to any big or small industrialist none of them has an investment plan so who's going to borrow and they, they, there was also a debate that the, the level of the super rich tax is amongst highest in india uh, like world the india is charging right now so people like investors in industry were thinking to relocate from india to some other country where the taxes is bit little bit lower look we are not the highest in the world we don't tax the rich we don't have a wealth tax we have most countries have a wealth tax we don't have an inheritance tax most countries have an inheritance tax the tax that we have on the rich is what 33% plus a surcharge surcharge still well below 40% most of europe has above 50% above 50% okay. many countries in the world have in excess of 70% so this is not a high rate at all sure rich people will always choose low tax or no tax jurisdictions that's the way rich people are yeah mm. 
I would say that we can put stringent rules. If you want to operate in India and make your money in India, you pay tax in India. If you don't want to, fine. <laughs> Recently, Raghuram Rajan said that the, the ongoing slowdown is very worrisome and there is a need of a fresh reforms. So according to you, what are the fresh reforms that the government should immediately take? You know, this idea that you can only kickstart growth through neoliberal market-oriented reforms, I think that is wrong. I would say the things you need, right now there's a crisis in demand, so what you do, you infuse demand. Mm. Where do you infuse it? To people who will spend the money. So double your employment guarantee, increase your spending on health and education. These are employment intensive, these create more jobs, these will have strong multiplier effects, you will create more demand. Okay, that's the first step. Is that a reform? Yes, it's a reform in the way you think about public finances and public spending. Okay. Second thing you do, you clean up the banking system and make sure they start lending in a viable way to small and medium enterprises. At the moment, small and medium enterprises cannot access funds and the rich guys who can access mm. funds don't want to invest. So that's the second. Third, you improve the public investment in the areas that matter. You know, in, in roads, in basic infrastructure, in electricity, in renewable cities and you do it in a green way. So one of the absurd things in the measures she announced is that the government is going to start buying cars. This is the same government that has declared that four years from now we are going to be all entirely electric vehicles. So at least say we will buy electric vehicles, no, we will buy cars, combustion engine cars. <laughs> Where is the planning? Are you thinking about moving to an ecologically sustainable future? Apparently not. And ma'am, like few months earlier, like there was a controversy started up after Ravind Subramanian said India's GDP number is overestimated by 2.5%. And like th th this went on to like come up with a lot of papers, Prime Minister Economic Advisory like rebutted that entire fact by fact and they came out that it's prevalent everywhere. Surjit Bhalla wrote an article and all these things. How do you see this entire GDP numbers game? You know, Surjit Bhalla is the person who's been saying India doesn't have any poverty. We've reached all the goals that are sustainable development goals and everything we've reached 10 years ago. We don't have any poverty. So that's the kind of economist we're talking about. Uh, I would say that um, I don't know exactly 2.5% lower or whatever, but I would say that the basic arguments that Arvind Subramaniam made are all extremely plausible, which is that we look at a set of indicators to understand how an economy is doing. A GDP is always an estimate because you're, uh, you know, in a, such an informal economy, you're making all kinds of guesses about the size of the informal economy and all kinds of things, mm -hmm. right? So we know that these are estimates. We know that everything else is showing us a decline. So it is extremely unlikely that GDP will be growing at 6% or 7%. If it is, it would be particular sectors that are disproportionately growing that don't reflect material well-being. Maybe finance is growing, or maybe, I don't know, some other sector is growing, which doesn't reflect material well-being. And talking about Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman being alumnus of, alumnus of JNU herself, like she is an appropriate choice as a finance minister. Look, I don't wish to comment on that. We've had all kinds of finance ministers. I don't even believe that the economic decisions or any decisions in the government are made in ministries anymore. I think they're all made in the PMO. So I wouldn't blame her alone for what has happened. I think the budget was a mess. I think what the finance ministry is doing at the moment doesn't indicate great economic thinking, but I wouldn't blame that on the finance minister. I would blame it on the prime minister. I believe the economic decisions have been made by a very small group of people. And um, this, uh, this, she also told it a few days back in a press conference that we are among the like, we are growing at a very good growth rates among all other countries in the world. And like this is a kind of a solace that she provided amid the economic turmoil. So do you think that is this a reason to sit you see, back? This is the whole point that first of all, you cook up your data so that you show a very rapid rate of GDP growth. Then you say, see, we're growing GDP. So it doesn't matter that employment has fallen by 15 million people in six years. Doesn't matter that shops are closing. Doesn't matter that enterprises are all sh shutting shop. Because GDP is growing. How do we know GDP is growing? Believe us. And Geeta Gopinathan yes. recently said that US-China trade war has a lot of opportunities as well. So what's your comment on that? Certainly, uh, countries like Vietnam, Philippines are actually doing better. India has not been able to take advantage of this so far. We've had one or two you know, com companies moving 
short, uh, lo relocating to India, but very few because we have poor infrastructure. We still don't have, you know, it's really very difficult for countries to uh, companies to relocate to India. So we have not been able to take advantage in that sense. If anything, we are losing because we used to export a lot to China that would re-export to the U.S. Now that has come down. So some of our exports have actually come down while we continue to import a lot from China. My last question is, uh, like, do you think that this situation is getting over somewhere in the future? Like the economic slowdown? It all really depends on how the government tackles it. So far, this is not a regime that has given me a lot of confidence in their economic management. Thank you. Thanks for joining us and talking to Outlook Money. You're most welcome.